And it's a great pleasure to be here and to be involved in this launch of the AASR. So I think many of you will know that we've been working on the AASR as AGRA since 2013, in fact. And it's it really emerged to be, become one of the preeminent uh, intellectual, I think, contributions of, for agriculture on the continent. There have been many topics which have been covered since 2013. And all of them, I think, have really landed on the challenges of the year, of the decade, and this year is no exception. So in previous years, we've talked about progress towards inclusive agricultural transformation, youth in ag, the role of government and private sector. But there's no doubting, of course, that this last year or so has been, well, quite a year. Many challenges faced by the continent. Uh, we see climate-related shocks up and down the continent, whether it's about severe weather events, whether we see <coughs> uh, the, the locust infestations and fall armyworm and so on. And then, of course, COVID-19 comes along and tests the continent and the people of the continent even further. So it's really quite an opportunity now to be able to talk about what we've chosen to talk about this year, because this year is also an opportunity year. We have the UN Food System Summit. So all of this coming together really helped the team to coalesce around the idea of focusing on food systems. Now, a lot of Words are being written and spoken about food systems. Where the AASR was targeted was really to draw out the African voice, the African narrative, African solutions. We were able to assemble a distinguished uh, group of authors who really knocked the ball out of the park, in my opinion. We go right the way across um, food systems, but related to the challenges of the continent. And I think you'll find as we go through our presentations and as you look at the report itself, um, we hope that this is a major contribution uh, to the uh, advancement of uh, the continent towards developing resilient food systems. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, for setting the stage. I'd now like to call um, uh, Professor Joachim von Braun, who chairs the scientific group of the United Nations uh, Food Systems Summit, and he's also a director um, at the Bonn University uh, for development uh, research. So, Professor von Braun, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. There is no greater pleasure for the professors to be part of the launch of an evidence-based report, such as the one before us on the African Agriculture Status Report with the key topic uh, which we are addressing in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations Food System Summit has thrust food systems transformation onto the main stage of international discourse in 2021, and for this decade, actually. Concepts of resilience, sustainability, green growth, and nutrition, nutrition-supportive food systems have gained tremendous traction globally and in Africa. A consensus, I believe, is emerging across the globe that our livelihoods and jobs and the health of the planet are fundamentally dependent on developing resilient and sustainable economies. Resilient, that is meaning to cope and prevent shocks and to bounce back from shocks. The true value and the true costs of food are now better understood, including indirect costs of health and climate and environment. Food systems are a fundamental part of our economic systems, which need to become resilient and sustainable. And making our food systems more sustainable means minimizing the disruptions they impose on our environments, our health and our cultures, including those of future generations. Adapting African food systems to become more resilient and sustainable will require significant investments from both African governments and the private sector. Raising yields and productivity on existing farmlands and in livestock systems is among the most important ways of making African food systems more resilient and sustainable. This will require integrating modern science and local knowledge to promote food systems re resilience and sustainability. 
raising whole systems productivity will also require utilizing circular economy and bioeconomy practices, such as converting organic waste into productive inputs in farm uh, production, water recycling, re renewable energy. All this requires agriculture research development and extension systems. African countries should spend at least 1% of their food systems related gross domestic product on related R&D. The global food system and Africa's food system can and must become climate positive. They must not continue to contribute to about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, as is currently the case. That's the figure for global um, food systems. Agroforestry and carbon farming with sound soil management is an opportunity for Africa's farming. In closing, for Africa's food systems transformation strategy, needed is applying contextualized and customized approaches. Rather than confining Africa's selection to, of strategic priorities to generalized remedies, such as either technological approaches or agroecology approaches, but Africa needs African approaches for the sustainability of the diverse African food systems, including technology and including agroecology. African approaches. We do have the knowledge to build sustainable and resilient food systems in Africa. I call upon our stakeholders at the AGRF to do their part to ensure that this effort is achieved. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Von Braun, and uh, for really uh, talking about the need for contextualized African approaches and to Further frame the issue, I'd like to now welcome uh, Dr. Beth Dunford, um, who is the Vice President of Agriculture, Human and Social Development at the African Development Bank. Uh, Dr. Beth Dunford, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and all protocol observed. I, I want to thank AGRA for inviting the bank to give a keynote address for the launch of the 2021 Africa Agriculture Status Report, or AASR. So we have two decades of action on food security and nutrition. We've got CADUP, AGRA, GASP, and more from which to learn and also to build. But we're also facing a more unpredictable future of shocks of global proportions. We are a year and a half into a global pandemic that has ravaged African economies. Global warming and extreme weather continue to intensify. And although Africa accounts for just 4% of global carbon emissions, its temperatures are expected to rise faster um, than global averages in 70% of the world's most climate vulnerable countries are in Africa. And today, 246 million Africans go to bed hungry each night. Global leaders are coming together at the UN Food Systems Summit and COP26 this year to commit to action on food security and climate change, both of which are inextricably tied to agriculture and Africa's future. The bank welcomes the 2021 AASR report as an important piece of knowledge work and analytics on sustainable agricultural productivity growth, agribusiness management, knowledge capacity, policy recommendations to guide decision-making at the highest level. Through its Feed Africa strategy and the associated flagships, the bank has committed in the last five years over 4 billion to raise agricultural productivity, support agribusinesses and facilitate an enabling policy environment which are the three principal components of the AASR 2021. In the next five to seven years, the bank will commit $10 billion to replicating success that has already been achieved in some countries to many others. So for example, the Feed Africa flagship Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation or TAT launched just two years ago has delivered heat tolerant um, wheat varieties to 1.8 million farmers in seven countries which has increased wheat production by 1.2 million metric tons with a value of $291 million. In Sudan, TAT delivered 65,000 metric tons of heat tolerant wheat varieties to farmers, which they cultivated on 294,000 hectares, hectares of land. This allowed Sudan to double its wheat production from less than half a million metric tons to over 1.1 million metric tons. Sudan now expects to be fully self-sufficient in wheat with three, within three years. 
Another example of this investment is the bank's Special Agro-Industrial Zones, or SAPZs, which are working in 14 countries across, across the continent. This initiative centralizes agro-processing activities like food processing, transport, and marketing into zones with high agricultural development potential. As the AASR report will show, there's been great progress made towards achieving a sustainable and reliant food system, but gaps remain. There's a yield gap, a technology gap, an advisory extension gap, infrastructure gap, and others. But most importantly, there's an investment gap. It has been shown that getting to zero hunger in Africa would require approximately $30 billion per year. This is new investment. How can we crowd in the public and private investments into building a food system that works for us all? Africa has to rise now and feed itself by rapidly upscaling efforts that have succeeded so far to boost food production. In response to a request by 17 African heads of state to raise funding available to boost food production on the African continent, the bank is doing just that through the creation of the financing facility for food and nutrition in Africa. This financing facility is based on five pillars. One, scaling up of proven climate adapted technologies. Two, creating an enabling environment for enhancing agriculture production. We know the governments must commit to policy and regulation that facilitates access to modern technologies. Three, building critical backbone infrastructure linking production areas to markets and processing at the national and regional levels. Four, crowding in private sector investments to access finance, business expertise, to grow commercial viability of food supply chains, and inclusion of more small and medium enterprises and smallholder farmers. And five, support to the Special Emergency Assistance Fund on famine and drought. The facility aims to reach 40 million farmers in double yields in nine commodities and produce 100 megatons of food, which would feed 200 million people and has the potential then to reach 81% of the chronically hunger, hungry in Africa. We'll be speaking more about it on Friday and we'll hope you will join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dunforth, um, for your endorsement of the AASR and for your multiple investments across the continent. Next speaker who can give us an overview of the AASR, that is um, Ms. Lulama Dibongo Traub, um, who can provide an overview and the key findings. Uh, welcome, uh, Lulama. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending upon where you're tuning in from. It's an absolute honor for me to stand on this platform today as an African woman. As far as I'm aware, and I can I stand to be corrected. This is the first time in the history of the African Agriculture Status Report that an African woman has served as a co-technical lead. In fact, it's the first time that this important report has had two women co-technical leads. I'm sincerely honored, and I thank President Kalibata for holding the door open for Louisa and I. Furthermore, when I look at the numbers, I note that in this year's AASR, seven of the 10 chapter leads are African, 27 of the 40 contributing authors are African, 12 African-based institutions were represented in the preparation of this report. So beyond the explicit recommendations made in the report, through the AASR, AGRA can pride itself in having taken the lead on amplifying African voices when addressing the challenge of building a resilient and sustainable agri-food system over the next decade. Now, in terms of the background of this report, in this report, our key focus was on identifying actionable and transformative strategies that would embed sustainability and resilience in African agri-food systems. The aim was that this report could, in some part, feed into the finalization of the African Common Position in the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit. In terms of the approach, we took a systems-wide approach. We recognize that food systems in general are complex and multifaceted, and in Africa in particular, we have a diverse range of actors. At the primary agricultural level, actors range from small-scale subsistence growers to large-scale commercial concerns, 
while in the downstream stages of the food system, it ranges from informal agri-processors, retailers, to large-scale multinational companies. In arriving at our recommendations, the authors were cognizant of this diversity. In terms of the key findings and way forward, while chapter one lists 15 main conclusions arrived at within the report, while chapter 10 outlines key priorities and actions for African governments, Pan-African organizations and development partners. But given the time constraints, I can only really focus on one key finding, which is the thread that runs through all the chapters. But fortunately though, the panelists in the next sequence are all contributing authors who will use their time to reflect on additional key findings and the way forward. In this way, we hope to do justice to the report. So what is that one thread that runs through most of the chapters? Well, it's simply this. The good news is that Sub-Saharan Africa has registered the most rapid rate of agricultural production growth since 2000 of any region in the world. Our output expanded by 4.3% per year in inflation adjusted US dollars. The world average over that same period was 2.7% per year. Fundamentally, this is a win for the continent. Now to the less good news. 75% of Sub-Saharan Africa's rapid agricultural production growth reflects rapid expansion in cropped area, only 25% from yield growth. In this decade, as a continent, we need to transition from resource dependent to productivity led agricultural growth. The status quo is not sustainable, both environmentally and socially. So, What's the way forward? How do we navigate this transition from resource dependent to productivity led growth? What is our pathway? Will we follow agroecology principles or do we lean into modern green revolution technologies? In this report, we conclude that it's not an either or approach. We can do it both ways. But to achieve this balance between these two approaches will absolutely require development of locally adaptive technologies and innovations that are context specific, climate smart, and can facilitate the adoption of sustainable improved practices. And to truly make this a local endeavor will require our national governments increasing their spending on agriculture R, D, and E. We know that this is not a new message, but it's a message that bears repeating. We've only to look at the history of economic thought, particularly at the Malthusian theory that predicted food production would not keep pace with population growth. What Malthus did not account for was the industrial revolution and its associated to uh, technologies. So will the fourth industrial revolution with its e-commerce and blockchain technologies embed sustainability and resilience into Africa's food systems over the coming decade? The only way we'll know is if we invest in Africa's capacity to develop innovative solutions in response to tipping points and the ever-changing landscape of the continent. Thank you very much, uh, Lulama and Dibongo Traub, um, for the good news that things are improving and improving well, but also that intensification is necessary and that all technology and all approaches are welcome and on board. And for setting the stage for the authors who are now, um, as we transition into the panelist session, um, I'm going to introduce several panelists and then invite them to share their key highlights and key inputs. The first will be Dr. Louise Fox, who is a senior fellow in the African Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute. Followed, following her will be Mr. Wandile Shilobo, who is the chief economist and the advisor to the president of South Africa. And will be followed by Professor Adesoji Adelaja, who is a distinguished professor of land policy at the Michigan State University. Each of these will share um, their key reflections uh, on this report uh, and have been authors in its development. So we'll start off with Dr. Louise Fox. Uh, welcome, share your image. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator. And I want to join my colleague, Professor Lulama, in really uh, thanking Agra for the opportunity to really engage on this report this year on this topic. It was really a pleasure to work 
with uh, Professor Lulama, with all of the African colleagues on this report, and all of the African institutions that we worked with to prepare this report. And I hope when you read the report, you will hear loud and clear the African voices that I heard that challenged me and hopefully will challenge you. Now, I, my job is to really sort of explain the conceptual framework of the report in two minutes. Not so easy, but here we go. We know that economic, social, and environmental sustainability has long been a, a key objective of development policy, but what's been mostly neglected has been the role of resilience. And when we started working on this report, I thought, well, why is that really? And I think it's because development economics, you know, mostly came, came from the global north. And in the global north, I think, especially in the 60s and 70s, we kind of took resilience for granted and we didn't understand where, how it came to the global north. So we just kind of uh, barreled forward on developing an e development economics without really thinking about the result, role of resilience in sustainability and economic development and its underpinnings. Now, this century, resilience is actually having a moment, of course, because we've had a lot more shocks. Um, it's also having a moment because if you look back over the last two decades, uh, as Professor Luluma mentioned, uh, Africa actually had some of the best two decades in terms of economic growth and development since independence. And that is really, as we show in the report, one of the key factors has been increased resilience, less volatility in agricultural output growth and overall GDP growth, and they track each other. If anybody thinks agriculture is not important to success in Africa, forget it. We, sh we can finish with that discussion. You can see how they track together and how they in the report. Okay, so now, however, we are coming to resilience you know, in the aftermath of the pandemic and, uh, and the global economic shock it brought about. And recent scholarship on resilience has really focused on governance and institutions as being really key uh, in terms of driving resilience. And because that gives um, a country at the macroeconomic level, at the community, at the macro level, at the national level, at the community level, and at the household level, you know, to be able to uh, handle complex problems, make decisions, form strategies, and implement them. And so that means state capability. Now, those are governance institutions, state capabilities. Those are words that are a lot easier said uh, than done. And so the important point, what we've learned, is that finding a way forward using these com com concepts requires each country to develop their own path and their own strategy, right? And so, and if, if you try to be too ambitious, you won't make it. So what I would say is in this report, we have no 75 point plan. We have really only um, some ideas, some concepts, some general recommendations, and some encouragement for countries to find their own way forward. Thank you very much. I think I now turn to my colleague, Soji. Good morning, Soji. Good morning. Um, well, it's, I'm very happy to be part of this um, launch event and to be part of the report itself. Um, it was great to work with a, a vast number of people who had very, very strong interest in uncovering some of these very important trends in issues in Africa. I think the point that I wanted to stress is that African countries made significant progress over the last 20 years in terms of um, uh, economic growth and the type of growth that they experienced were consistent, consistent with uh, long-term self-reliance and sustainability. But we should not forget that the post-2000 period also incre uh, witnessed increased exposure to various shocks and stressors. And we must pay attention to these things. For example, 
natural disaster incidents increased threefold, affecting millions of people. And conflict incidents increased tenfold, um, creating significant increase in fatalities. And these are on top of health-related shocks like Ebola, cholera, malaria, which stress already weak health systems. And then, of course, we have the ongoing pandemic. We should expect growing incidents of these shocks and stressors in coming decades. For example, with conflict, if we don't address the root causes, um, such as poverty, uh, lack of economic progress, and marginalization, ethnic marginalization, um, it would be very difficult to reverse the trend. Of course, climate change will continue to spew uh, growing incidents of drought, desertification, and other climate-related shocks. Um, improvements are needed in the health system in order to mitigate the effects of uh, um, epidemics and pandemics. And of course, we need to remember that several economies being resource dependent are also overly exposed to things like exchange rate volatility and, um, and resource uh, price shocks. One of the things we need to note is that these shocks not only cause economic slowdowns, they have the potential to throw African economies off track for long periods of time, therefore affecting their economic transformation trajectories. While some of these shocks can be avoided, the effects of others must be effectively mitigated by developing resilience strategies. Um, the humanitarian interventions that these shocks and stressors bring are major distractions for African countries. So my final message is that in addition to traditional growth strategies, countries must build resilience to emerging shocks and stressors in order to accelerate their journey to self-reliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, also to share the reflections, we'd like to welcome Wandile Shilobo. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks again to Agra um, and uh, all the co-authors uh, in this report. I want to just pull up a few points that are also just an addition to Lulama and Louise and Soji. And the key point I would begin with is to say the African continent is still relatively uh, standing with some of the problems that existed uh, before the COVID-19 shocks. And, and those will continue to compromise the resilience in Africa's agriculture. So has spoken to one of those being the climate change and associated shocks, uh, also biosecurity and uh, the, the fight to really try to manage animal diseases is one of the big issues and also pest infestations no productivity issues, and also just a lack of adequate infrastructure. But in the report, we put up about two points that I want to focus on. And uh, these two overarching points, the first one being uh, the need for creating an enabling policy environment across the African continent. And the governments here can focus more on ensuring that there are clear competition and major regulations uh, in a number of countries in the region. And the yeah. second point, uh, and the second point that I think it's important uh, here is also the need for tax incentives for the SMMEs that the governments can pretty much put in place and that will incentivize uh, the investments. We also reflect uh, on the need for regulatory environment to promote quality standards in the inputs and output markets uh, on the, in the agriculture. And also obviously the predictable trade policies which we continue to see being a very disruptive for some of the private sector enterprises across the region. And in addition to that, the need for digitalization of the custom procedures, harmonization of border regulations. So those are some of the key things that we, we highlight in the report. And the last uh, and, and also important point obviously here is around the investments, because we believe that the private sector investment, particularly SMMEs uh, from the region, but also global investors, will pretty much come in if all of the policy issues that I've reflected to some of the few are, are, are pretty much addressed. 
And also the fact that public investments remains an important issue, especially around the public infrastructure and the border infrastructure, because this also obviously assists us a lot when we think about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And the closing statement from my side, I would say here, in addressing and implementing all of these reforms, the African governments really need at this time around to ramp up the pace on policy reforms. And if that happens, obviously well-sequenced investments could follow, then technical innovation, competition and efficiency gains is something that we could all look forward to. And thank you so very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wandile. Um, yes, please uh, clap hands. <laughs> Um, what Professor Lulama has done with her team has really helped uh, highlight uh, key, key aspects of the report. Um, if you're like me and like summaries, uh, Professor Lulama talked about Chapter 1 and Chapter 10 uh, we being recommendations and key insights, so I really would encourage you to look at that. We're now going to drill down a little bit. Um, as you heard, uh, recommendations were made there on what government needs to do, tax incentives, regulatory reform, policy, uh, reform. And so um, I would like to break into another panel session. Uh, this one will go deeper into uh, answering the question on how to ensure healthy and nutritious diets while minimizing social costs on things like obesity, high levels of malnutrition, and high occurrences of health-related diseases. And for this, we have three panelists. Uh, one we are honored to have is live, and that is the Honorable Minister of Agriculture of Malawi, who is um, the Honorable Lobin Lo. I would like to welcome you, sir, to join us on the stage. I'm afraid you will be the only one, but I know as a government minister you are not shy of the limelight, so welcome, sir. Um, I would also like to welcome um, Dr. Lawrence Haddad, who is the global, who works for the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition Gain, and also Mrs. Ndindi Okonkwo Nueneli, who is the managing partner of Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited. Um, and uh, I think we shall start with the Honorable Minister. Uh, you're welcome, sir. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful to the organizers of uh, this panel for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Uh, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, the call by global leadership to bring and engage everyone in the food systems value chain as we search for solutions to accelerate our efforts towards achievement of the sustainable development goals is a net notable one. The recent social, economic, and uh, environmental challenges we have encountered have actually reminded us that uh, as human beings, we can come together and work together a common goal. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, this initiative is a welcome development, especially considering that uh, besides supporting national dialogues and at articulation of pathways to achieve sustainable food systems. Its perspective span beyond the food systems summit and focuses on building a platform for transformation. Uh, policy development, capacity building, innovation, as well as investment. Let me now turn to some of the findings uh, highlighted in the report that resonate well with Malawi on the subject matter. Uh, when we talk of production or agricultural production in Malawi, there is some growth. Uh, for Malawi, the general picture in terms of production, the prospect looks favorable. The Fed loan production estimate results a project at 21% increase in maize production, which is our staple of food, uh, from 3.7 million metric tons in the 2019-2020 season to 4.5 metric tons 
meaning that we have over a million metric tons surplus. Uh, generally, the yields have increased due to favorable weather condition and improved input intake by farmers, mostly due to government programs uh, on subsidy, uh, such as uh, affordable inputs program, we call it AIP. Uh, production in increments are also noted in other food crops, such as uh, passes and rice. You may wish to know that uh, as a country, we have a unique variety of rice, very unique. We call it kilombero. Unique for its taste, aroma. I wish I had brought some samples here, you could agree me. It's, it's like perfume. Uh, thinking about food systems differently now, the food systems in Malawi fulfill the purposes for food security, national and health, environmental sustainability, social economy, and uh, territorial balance. Ladies and gentlemen, about 90% of the food supply in the country comes directly from agriculture, and most of Malawi's household food availability is generally determined by own production. This means that uh, any production bottlenecks and shocks have a huge uh, repercussion on the overall food security and the performance of the food systems of the country. The dialogues has come at an opportune time for us to solicit views from different stakeholders, uh, from policy makers to farmers, on how to transform their food systems. Taking a food system approach is essential for the fulfillment of the 70 sustainable development goals as food systems touch every aspect of human existence. The performance of food systems has a direct effect on human and environmental health, including economy, economies and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, the majority of Malawian population remain reliant on the agriculture sector for their livelihood. From the dialogues, it was noted that uh, household resilient to shocks is low, especially in rural areas. High levels of poverty, gender e economic inequalities, and also limited access to basic services and infrastructure has indeed exposed Malawi to the problem. The poor road infrastructure has made transportation of our food very difficult, leading to not only high food prices, but also compromised quality and safety of food. In this case, we are being challenged to ensure that our food is not only available, but also accessible all over in the country. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for your assurance that this report is of value to you. Um, we congratulate you on the improved yield uh, for maize, and we look forward to that happening. I have had the Kilombera rice. It's uh, fantastic. I look forward to it being on the shelves of Nairobi one day. Um, we would now like to ask uh, Dr. Lawrence Haddad from GAIN to kindly uh, share uh, his opinions with regards to how to ensure healthy and nutritious diets while still uh, regarding is social issues like uh, obesity and high levels of malnutrition. Uh, Dr. Haddad, welcome. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, all protocols observed. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalabata and, and Andrew Cox for inviting me to reflect on the AASR. <clears throat> and my congratulations to the authors of the AASR. I've had a look at chapter one. Uh, it looks really amazing and I can't wait to, del to delve into the rest of it. So, so big congratulations. I wanted to give you five points. I've got five minutes, a bit less now, five points. Um, first of all, around healthy diets. First of all, um, in, every, in whatever country you live in, whether it's whatever continent you live in, whether it's Africa or Europe where I live, um, poor quality diets are the main driver 
of the burden of disease, so premature mortality and morbidity. That's just a fact, um, very, very clear. Uh, in Africa, the State of Food Insecurity report that was published last year tells us that uh, about 75% of the population cannot afford a healthy diet. So this is this is a, a massive uh, issue because healthy diets are at the center of preventing all forms of malnutrition. We know one in three people are malnourished worldwide. We know that mal malnutrition, um, especially undernutrition, basically destroys destroys bodies. It destroys brains, immune systems, bones, and muscle. So it's generating flows of healthy foods, nutritious, safe foods to people who are living on very low incomes is the, the primary goal of the day. The, the, the additional goal is to do that in a way that doesn't wreck the environment, generates good work and good, good incomes for farmers and builds resilience. Second point, there are so many opportunities for governments and businesses and development partners to make, to increase the flow of foods that are really important parts of healthy diets. And I'm talking about uh, fruits and vegetables and, pl and uh, plant-based foods like pulses, uh, also eggs and dairy and fish, nuts, uh, some types of meats. These, these foods are really important for a healthy diet. Uh, think about on the supply side, where is government uh, research and development and agriculture focused? Is it focused 95% on staple foods? If it is, it's probably overly, overly invested in staple foods. There might be some uh, economic gains, some nutrition gains, and some environment gains from thinking about how to reallocate that. I think about government procurement policies. Governments buy huge amounts of food for schools, for hospitals, for the social protection programs. Are governments sending the right signals to the private sector and to its consumers and citizens about the kinds of foods that are important to consume. Think about the food environments, food-based dietary guidelines. Most governments have guidelines for consumers, but those guidelines could easily be guidelines for policymakers as well. Are our government policies in line with government's own food-based dietary guidelines? And then think about how we demand, create the demand for nutritious foods. Most campaigns for nutritious foods, including in my own country, the UK, tend to be tend to start from this food is healthy, therefore you should eat it. But of course, the private sector knows brilliantly how to market our stuff we don't need and don't want. So they start where we are, and then they focus on how can we connect health to that. And very often, some of the most powerful campaigns are based on cultural preferences, cultural norms, traditional values. Use those and then link them to health. My third point is that you've got to do all of this environmentally soundly. Um, that's not as difficult as it seems. There are many choices. There are many different foods uh, that have many different uh, environmental footprints on many different dimensions of environment. Environment footprint is not just about greenhouse gases. It's about water use, energy use, land use, nitrogen cycles, phosphorus cycles. All of these different foods have different implications for those different dimensions. And th those, those impacts will differ by the way in which they were produced. So what I'm trying to say here is that, is that governments and farmers and others have, have lots of choices about how to produce these nutritious foods that are affordable, but are also environmentally regenerative. Point number four, African food systems are in a, it feels to me, uh, and I'm taking uh, Professor von Braun's point to heart, that the, there is an incredible diversity of uh, food systems within Africa, often within a single country in Africa, and that uh, African solutions are paramount. Um, but it feels like at, the, at a continent level, there is an opportunity, a window for African food systems to achieve the good without achieving, without generating too much of the bad. Many, many food systems in Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe have kind of gone past this point. They've, they've achieved lots of good outcomes, but they've also generated a huge number of negative environmental consequences and negative health consequences. It feels, and I, I, I look at the AGRF, AGRF report from a couple of years ago on the hidden middle, it feels like the hidden middle is, is potential a way of potentially making African food systems achieving the good while minimizing the bad through technology leaps, knowledge leaps, infrastructure leaps, and even institutional leaps. I mean, how many 
how many um, how many governments have actually been able to organize themselves around food systems? Um, certainly not many in Europe, North America, Latin America or Asia. Fantastic if Africa can be the leader in this space. And my final point is around investment. And Beth Dunford mentioned this. And one of the one of the downsides of taking a food system approach is that everything seems to become incredibly complicated. And where do I start and what do I prioritize? Uh, and, but I think uh, taking a food system perspective is more like taking a wide angle lens approach. Look at the landscape around you. Consider the indivisibility of the outcomes. Look at all the opportunities for action. And in doing that, you can either become paralyzed or you can think to yourself, okay, this, this helps me sequence what needs to happen in my, my country, my region, and it helps me to prioritize, prioritize what I need to do and therefore develop an investment plan that really is focused, but also is cognizant of all the other possibilities and connections that food systems uh, provide. So I, I just kind of congratulate the AASR report authors. It's a brilliant report. I look forward to reading more of it and, and I've been inspired by it. Thank you, colleagues. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haddad. Um, and now I would like to call on the last panelist, who is uh, Mrs. Dindi Okonkwenweli, who uh, runs food companies and is on the board of many private sector uh, companies to share her unique perspectives you know, on what the private sector can really do and private food processors can do uh, to help build sustainable and resilient food systems in Africa. Over to you, Dindi. Thank you so much and congratulations to the authors and to Dr. Agnes Kalibata. I am a big fan of these reports and have used them in a lot of my work. And building on what Lauren said, the hidden middle, which was produced in 2019, was groundbreaking in reinforcing the important role of SMEs, especially SMEs that connect farmers and consumers. And that's what I wanna talk about today, the role of food processors. I strongly believe that food processors in Africa are critical to our value chains because they address post-harvest losses, they ensure traceability, and they also ensure food safety. And this is all critical to us achieving SDG2, but also building resilient food systems. Now, what are the two, three things they need and actions they need to take? One is securing their supply chain. And this is paramount. And it means we have to map out where our farmers are, where there are gluts and where there's an abundance and to work collaboratively to stabilize food prices so that we have a steady stream of consistent, high quality produce sourced from Africa, processed in Africa for African consumers. Sadly, this is not being done at scale. And this requires SMEs working through the associations, but also partnering with ecosystem actors such as AGRA and others across the ecosystem to improve the productivity of farmers, to improve the livelihoods of farmers, but also to ensure food safety and traceability. If enough of our agro processors are sourcing locally, it has a tremendous ripple effect across the entire ecosystem. The second thing is that SME food processors need to innovate to reduce the cost of processed food that's sourced in Africa. There's a price point in many of our countries, especially for the most vulnerable in Nigeria, it's 50 Naira. If something is more than 50 Naira, people will not afford to pay for it. They won't buy it. And the challenge is, can we get nutritious food that is below that price point? It's imperative that SMEs work with research institutions, with uh, faculties at academic institutions and with our government to innovate to ensure that we have affordable, available, nutritious food. And this requires innovation. Nourishing Africa is working on an innovation hub, but we need a lot more partners collaborating. And the final thing is distribution. Food processors need to get their food in the right hands. Sadly, the multinationals have built this large distribution channels. Most SMEs cannot compete, especially African SMEs. And this will require that our industry associations and SMEs work with our food retailers and collaborate in our open markets to address the high cost of distribution and also ensure inclusive where we're engaging women in building these distribution channels. If we can ensure that we're sourcing locally and buying from smallholder farmers, we're innovating to get the price points right and we're ensuring low cost and affordable distribution mechanisms, 
we'll see a transformation and explosion in the food processing landscape. And this requires finally an enabling environment from our governments. We need our governments to support SMEs through infrastructure investments to reduce the high cost of transportation. We need roads, rail, um, and shipping systems to ensure that we can trade across Africa, we can trade within our countries, and that we can get food to the most vulnerable and the masses that need it. I'm excited about the future of our continent with SMEs, and food processors driving the transformation required. And I look forward to reading the report and partnering with many of you to fulfill the promise that Africa can feed itself and feed the world. Oh, thank you very much for that. I hope that's given you a very good foretaste of the report. I hope it has whet your appetite and that you're looking forward to downloading it, reading it. And I, like her, use these reports every year for my work. Now, um, we are approaching the time when we officially launch the report. And so it's my great honor to introduce, to welcome, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, the president of AGRA, to give her reflections on the publication. Karibu sana. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, for, I want to thank everybody that has participated in the publication of this report. I want to thank you, Professor Joachim, for being our chief guest today, and all the other guests that participated. Every year, like was said earlier, we think through some of the challenges that the African continent is facing, and we try to draw on the best in the areas that we are thinking through, and we, we encourage them to participate in a report, but we really make sure that we bring out some of Africa's finest experts, scientists, and have them tell us from where the continent is at, what they are learning. This year, the challenge that was on, my, on our minds has come out very clearly in the discussion that you had today. I would say three things were on our minds. Given where we are at today, given the crossroads we find that ourselves at today, where do we go from here? Remember, AGRA is the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Our institution was built on the premise that Africa, too, needs to achieve a green revolution. That very concept is itself at crossroads, is being put to question. But for good reasons. You had some of the examples that were being given. But does that mean or let me put it differently, what does that mean for Africa? Where do we go from here and how do we go from here? So I really want to thank the people that took on this report and tried to dive into the report and bring out some of the challenges. I've been talking about Africa expanding at the cost of the environment at 30%. You heard from the report, actually I'm wrong, it's 75% expansion to produce food. But we know that we don't need to be engaging and using land at 75% to produce food. The cost is huge. So the report brought out the fact that we probably need to think about, and again, this is extremely Africa-specific, we need to think about what type of things we need to be bringing together, how much of what do we need to do to move Africa forward. Not so much the a typical green revolution way, but also not, not paying attention to the need to use inputs the way we are doing today is costing us too much. We just can't expand at the cost of natural resources. So again, interesting crossroads that we must ad address and think through as a continent. Rollins brought out a number of things around nutrition one of our biggest challenges. It costs us so much. And yet, we have the ability to do the right thing from a nutrition perspective. There's no, if there's no continent that has better capability to feed its people with the right food because these things actually grow in our backyards. But our, we, we just don't know what to do when it comes to eating healthy, feeding healthy. 
But we need to do something about it because it's impacting our children, it's impacting our population, it's costing us dollars. So really a lot of stuff to think about. The Minister of Agriculture of Malawi brought out something that has come, come up once, uh, several times in the Food System Summit, the cost of food. He called it the economics of food systems. In the Food System Summit, we are talking about the true cost of food. And the true cost of food is the cost to health. The true cost of food is the cost to the environment. And the true cost of food is the poverty that we are not able to deal with when we, we actually have food systems that don't deliver better livelihoods for people. So lots of ideas have come out, and I'm extremely grateful that we had the opportunity to listen to this. And thank you, Ndidi, for really bringing out again and linking our SMEs and private sector to what is important. In the morning, we were saying the SME is the vehicle that gets to deliver all this. And the D-Room launch today morning was in recognition of that vehicle. And we need to support and find resources to fund our SMEs. Otherwise, it becomes a vicious cycle. We are not moving forward. We can't make things from nothing. So linking those, these two conversations is what you just did for us indeed. Now, I do recognize we are running out of time. It, I could go on and on, but I really want to thank the authors of the report. I want to thank everybody that's participated in this report and made sure that uh, once again, we have a knowledge piece that the continent could use. Once again, we have a, a reference point that we could use to be able to advance some of the, the, er, the ideas that we, we want to advance. I also want to recognize that having the AGRF, the Africa Green Revolution Forum, take place every year. For us, is really a step probably ahead of even the Food System Summit because every year we get to meet, we get to discuss what we need to do differently. And I'm really proud that we do have this forum. So Professor Joachim, I'm coming back to you uh, because we've come to that moment where we get to launch the ASR. And again, I thank you and I welcome you to join us in the launch of the Africa Agricultural Status Report for 2021. Welcome, Professor Joachim. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, Kalibata. Um, the rocket we are launching targets a moon-like target. It targets the decade of action, building sustainable and resilient African food systems. So this is the launch pad we are standing at. It positively aims this rocket to boost and add guidance to the UN Food System Summit actions for and by Africa. AGRA's longstanding commitment to smallholder agriculture as have its AGRF partners. AGRA and AGRF are learning networks. I applaud you, President Agnes Kalibata, President of AGRA and the many AGRA and AGRF stakeholders and partners for addressing the challenge of food systems transformation and for viewing this challenge as an opportunity, an opportunity to embed resilience and sustainability in Africa's food system. Wishing the report big impact, the African Agriculture Status Report 2021 is hereby launched. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Joachim. Thank you, everybody that contributed to this report, and thank you to all our panelists. And